My name is Doug, this is Michelle. We're gonna talk about uh, pests, insects in the garden, fungus, and how, how to deal with all that. Um, and the first, I think the first important point really is the, the concept of integrated pest management. And what that means basically is that you do as much as you can to maintain a healthy environment so you you select the right plants that are a little more resistant to insects and diseases. You put them in the correct spot. So in other words, the shade of the plant is not out in the blazing sun and vice versa. And you take good care of them. Their soil is amended when you plant them, you fertilize them, and you look after your garden essentially. Uh, because you know, when the weather gets warm, you can get uh, aphids, you can get all kinds of things, and it can happen pretty quickly. So the important thing is to, to keep track of what's happening in your yard, check it out. If you're not sure, come in and talk with us. We have, uh, you can see behind me here, we've got a microscope that projects onto a computer screen, and it's uh, pretty good at identifying whether you have a fungal problem insects. Sometimes we'll put some leaves some here and just look at it for a little bit and then we'll see something creeping along. We'll see, okay, that looks like something, an insect of some kind. So basically, just like your doctor might say, you know, stay healthy, exercise, all that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. Same concept applies to your plants. You know, water them properly, but don't overwater them. I was just talking to a lady here this morning who said, I've been watering my plants every day. And I thought, well, why would you do that? We just had over two feet of snow. The ground is pretty wet. You could probably back off on that watering. Uh, Wintertime watering is usually maybe twice a month if we don't have any moisture. And a little bit of dusting of snow doesn't amount to much. But two feet of snow is several inches of rain. And that's out of where everything's in pretty good shape. In fact, I think most of our yards are, are draining now and are probably pretty wet. So just in the sense that for example, a lot of people get bark beetles, they have big pine trees, maybe they live near the national forest. Bark beetles inevitably are attracted to trees that are not as healthy and are not hydrated properly. So when the tree or a shrub is hydrated properly, uh, the bark beetles can't get into the bark quite as easily because the moisture is in there. It's pushing them out, keeping them away. That's why you'll see in a forest, there's a big drought, we can't go out and water all those trees. Those trees are susceptible. They're susceptible to bark beetles because they're unhealthy trees. So a healthy environment is what's going to be the environment that will mean that you're going to have fewer insects and fewer problems. So that's just kind of the overall general idea of this integrated pest management concept. You know, it can go on and on depending on how much you subscribe to it. Some people say, well, if you take it to its extreme, uh, you don't use any sprays, you hand pick bugs, and grasshoppers, and so on. I'm not sure that's really quite the right solution, but it's, the idea is that uh, it's kind of an incremental process. And that's sort of the big picture of why you won't need, you're gonna have fewer problems if your plants are healthy. Michelle? Absolutely. Um, the other thing with um, the prevention is the healthier the plant is, the, the less you're going to have to worry about it. Um, another way of doing it is to protect it before issues happen. Um, with uh, the all season dormant oil is one of the first products that you're going to put on in the springtime. Um, basically, you put it on when your trees are sticks. Um, it is an oil-based product, so it's going to coat the bark. Um, it's great for fruit trees, and that, um, next week we'll talk about that a lot. Um, mm -hmm. But for roses, um, because they get black spot and, and aphids, um, it works on both, so it, it's really good. Um, basically, when the insect itself, uh, mm -hmm. in the fall, they lay eggs on your 
our trees. And those stay dormant until spring. Um, the nice thing about the cold winter we just had, a lot of those issues probably um, killed off a lot of the insects that we have. That doesn't mean I wouldn't go ahead and use the preventative just in case, because if, if anything does stay on it, if you have a warm spot that it didn't kill them, this will get rid of them before it happens. Um, that being said, the way um, insects and fungi work is that they, they blow in with the wind. Um, birds bring them in. Um, so you have to always be on alert for those issues. Um, look at your garden. If it's not something you just plant and walk away from. You want to go out and inspect. Um, if you can catch stuff early enough, you can spray off aphids with a hose um, because they have such soft body tissue. If you spray them off, they're gone. Um, but you have to kind of watch because when aphids come in, it's usually not just one or two, there's a lot of them. Um, so keep an eye on it, be uh, diligent with it, um, and you can actually do anything without spraying. If you need to spray, um, we're going to go into the stuff that you're going to use to, to get rid of insects and fungal issues. So we talk about good insects and bad insects. So we know that the aphids and the thrips and the mites are harmful to our plants. But in the springtime here, we have uh, ladybug releases. And uh, it's, we, it's, we have a lot of fun with that. And kids get all excited. Ladybugs can eat a lot of aphids. Now, sometimes ladybugs fly away and they go somewhere else. I don't know if that means because they've eaten all the aphids and they decide to prey your neighbor's yard. But uh, aphids and spiders and praying mantis those are beneficial insects in your garden, and they can eat a lot of the bad pests. Sometimes the praying mantis can eat the good pests as well, but it's sort of a trade-off. So uh, that's the other thing is understanding, understanding what the problem is, understanding what the bug is. So people come in and say, we've got all these spiders all over. Well, they may, that might be okay. And the praying mantis, you know, we see them in here, we just, we just let them be. We figure, okay, they're probably going to eat the aphids. So good insects, bad insects, good environments, bad environments, really an issue of learning what your little microclimate is, your environment, and learning how you can deal with all these pests rather than just say, well, I need whatever, one, one shot cures all spray. That isn't always the best approach. Um, with uh, insects uh, and spraying, your product. Timing is everything. Um, basically you want to apply all your products early in the morning um, because usually the wind is low. It doesn't blow as much. Um, you want to be, really be careful when you spray. You don't want to have that overspray on there. Um, and, and the bees aren't as active early in the morning. Um, so you, you're, you want to make sure you're doing things the proper way at, at the proper time. One of the questions that often comes up when people come in and they're considering herbicide, fungicide, insecticide, whatever it might be, is we try and stock products that are going to are relatively benign. They may not kill everything all the time, but they're going to be okay for your dogs and your cats. People always wonder, what this can I spray and my dog's gonna come out in the yard? Well, it's best to keep the dog inside, let the spray dry, which is gonna happen pretty quickly. Um, with, without getting into all the specifics of the products, we have products that contain neem oil, um, and, uh, and this, the, the winter spray, winter oil that Michelle was talking about is a mineral oil. So a lot of these products, right, while they're not necessarily organic by a strict definition, they are something that is more benign. So we, we're trying to don't sell any Roundup, we don't sell malathion, that kind of stuff. We don't believe in that, and I don't. I think most people are trying to stay away from that kind of thing. It doesn't mean that you properly used, effectively, and at the right time, these products can be very successful for your yard. 
but I think that it's, it's better if we feel comfortable uh, that, you know, you've got to, say you have uh, those bugs on your squash, squash bugs. Right? Squash bugs. Right. They're terrible, right? And they're ugly and they smell and all that. Well, we have products you can spray and, and you can still eat the squash. So I think that's important that we feel comfortable that the, what we have are safe products. We can read about the, you know, what the content is and so you understand a little bit about that. Another thing about products that's important, any kind of spray, people come in and you know, we'll show them this, you know, I might try this for this fungicide for uh, your powdery mildew, whatever the case might be. And then inevitably the question always is, well, how much do I use? What's the mixture? And if you look at the uh, little sheets on the back of the container, you kind of need a microscope to read them. And even my powerful bifocals don't help me too much with that. But the point is that I, I try and tell folks that it's really important that you read that label and understand, you need to understand how it's used. That is your contract with that. Because if you were to spray, say, uh, you know, weed spray, and it drifted it into your neighbor's yard and kills some of their plants or injured their animal, you're responsible for that. And you, you know, as a good neighbor, a good citizen, and good gardener, you need to understand that, you know, the, the, the ratio of mixing is a certain level and it's important to abide by that. And so read that label and understand uh, the instructions rather than just have me say, oh, just mix it up and spray it and everything will be fine. It's, uh, it's a little more specific than that. Okay, um, so for right now, um, we are going to start with our insecticides um, and kind of just go through what they will take care of and how to use them. Um, so the first one that we want to talk about um, is the triple action. Um, this is the neem based product that Doug was talking about. Um, it's neem oil and a, a percentage of pyrethrin, uh, which is a synthetic crushed chrysanthemum that they, they made. Um, so this is one of the very safe products that you can use. You can use this on your vegetables, um, pretty much anything. And the really nice thing about this is it's a three-in-one. So it's an insecticide, a fungicide, and a miticide. So this kind of does the whole gambit of stuff. Um, the one caution I will say on this, it isn't any oil-based products. You want to be careful with our intense sunshine. If you spray it in the middle of the day, you're going to fry your plant. Um, so spray early, early in the morning. I can't emphasize that enough. That's, that's the time to spray. Um, so this comes in a ready-to-use spray bottle or it has, we have a, a concentrated version that you can mix up in um, either a pump and sprayer, hose and sprayer. Um, on that thought, I would say, make sure that you have label your sprayers. You wanna make sure that your herbicides, which are your weed killers, don't get mixed up with your insecticides because you're gonna spray that on your good stuff and if there's any insect or herbicide in there, you're gonna kill everything you spray. So make sure you label your sprayers, um, have two different ones for uh, weeds and for insects. You can do the fungicide, if you're gonna do two separate ones, you can do fungicide and insects together, um, but you don't wanna do the herbicides in the same model as these two, okay? Um, Talking about sprayers, we have several different types. Um, the nice thing about the one Doug is holding, um, it is a self-mixing sprayer. So if you have a lot to spray, um, you just put the product in the, the container, you set the dial to however many tablespoons the directions say, and you use the your water, to, it, it'll mix it itself. So Anything that's left over, you can put it back in the bottle and it doesn't contaminate anything. So it's really nice. It doesn't sit there. Um, the, the thing with this one, you do want to clean it uh, when you're done um, because if the tube gets clogged, you'll have to get one. But it is a pricey sprayer, but 
it, you, it's the only one you'll have to buy, um, unless you don't clean it. <laughs> one of the things that's good about it is you see most of the pieces are metal. The plastic ones, sometimes after a few years, they just kind of crack, you know, things crack here and low humidity that we have. Uh, so when you, after you use this, uh, as Michelle mentioned, the spray is in the container, and so it's not it doesn't get diluted, and it, so you can you just put it back in the main container. It's undiluted and be ready for reuse again. That's one of the things that's not a good idea to keep mixed sprays around, and you're not quite sure what it is. After a period of time, it kind of breaks down. It's not as effective. So this sprayer is good for that. It's easy to clean. Then you can you can put water in there and hose it down after you're all done. I like this one, Michelle. I've used this one around here. This one's nice because it's not heavy. You can just kind of take it wherever you go. Um, it does a little bit more than a spray bottle, and it saves your finger a lot. Um, you just pump it up, hit the switch, and then it just sprays what you need to spray. There's a little knob here that you can go and it'll stop the spray. Um, so it's really handy to use. Again, make sure you label what you're putting in here um, and, and rinse it out when you're done. I try not to make a big batch of, of any type of uh, insecticide or fungicide just because I don't want to have to worry about dumping it somewhere. Um, we don't want that in our drinking water. So I try to use as little as possible, which is why I use the hose ends more than anything else. I do have a small handheld sprayer like that, so I can just use it as I need to. Um, but um, dormant oil, you want to use a hose end sprayer. Most of the stuff that you're going to spray it on um, is tall. Usually, like I said, this is used for fruit trees. Um, there's a couple of times that you're going to use this. Um, you want to get the eggs and, and the, fungal, uh, the fungus that is, is laying dormant on the bark. Um, but you'll also use this. This is what you use for your uh, apple trees and your pear trees with coddling moth. Um, those uh, brown spots in your apples and pears, um, the coddling moth actually lays their eggs in the blossom. So uh, it's the worm coming out opposed to something going in. Uh, so you want to do this now. Once the tree is leafed out, I don't recommend using any oils on your trees because they will fry. Michelle, do you is that a horticultural oil? It is. Yeah. So do you spray the, the the tree or how do you how do you apply? His question was, how do you apply the, the horticultural oil? Um, so basically when the tree is dormant, you're just going to spray the entire tree, the bark. You want it to run off your coating. You're just putting a protective coating on, on the branches. Um, it, when you're spraying it for the coddling moth, basically you're waiting for the flowers to start dropping their petals. Um, and then you'll start spraying the flowers. And again, I can't emphasize enough, you want to do it early in the morning. If you hit the bees with the mineral oil, unfortunately, you will kill them. So if you can do it before the bees get active, that is better. Um, also, if you want to wait until e late evening, if it's a, you know, not, a, not a windy day, that'll work too, because they're not active. Yes, ma'am. Can you use that on like um, blackberry bushes and grapes? Absolutely. She asked if you can use this on uh, blackberry bushes and grapes. Yeah, you can use it on anything, um, especially like roses that are prone to it. Kind of know your plants too. Know what's going to have the issues. Roses are notorious for fungal issues and aphids. Um, your, your fruit trees, they have thrips, they have um, shot hole, it's a big fungal issue that they get. Um, so, so know what gets diseases and, and, and
having sex and no treat them before it happens. This is a little bit of uh, housekeeping, you might say. Uh, we just received the clipboard that Penny can, that can is going to pass around. And if you would like to receive emails about topics such as these or whatever is going on here in the garden center, sign up for that if you haven't already. And uh, you get information weekly. We don't send that to anybody else. It's just for the Waters newsletter. And then it will also tell you in about a week or so that this class is on YouTube video, and I know you're going to want to watch it again, right? <laughs> it's so informational and everything. But it'll show you also that we have all kinds of classes that are archived, all kinds of topics. I look at them from time to time, and it's just a good thing. You know, you wonder, okay, in a few months I'll be starting my vegetable garden. What do we have to say about vegetable garden? Because we may have covered that, but maybe you aren't here. So you can always catch up on previous classes would be at the YouTube videos. And Shelly, should I talk about gross? Sure. So, um, yes, what question? Is that, what was the question? Do these items require respiratory uh, items? I always say go in being prepared uh, for the worst, even though you don't need it. Um, but. I, I put a mask on uh, just to make sure you don't get any back spray. Hopefully you're doing it without the wind so you won't get any of that. Wear proper gloves. I wear, um, treat it like a regular one because if you get oil in your eye, it's going to burn. So you, you really want to protect yourself. And not applying on a windy day. I saw some weeds yesterday. I thought I would just grab my weed spray and not every noticed that it was kind of windy, so I said, okay, I'll wait early morning, as you know, is usually the best time. So one other, one other different subject I would like to mention, which is kind of a pet peeve of mine as far as gardening pets, grubs. Grubs, if you haven't had the pleasure of seeing one, are these gross white things, kind of curled up. They're actually beetle larvae. So there are hundreds of thousands of beetles in this world. And grubs are, they had a really good summer last year. As a matter of fact, last spring, they wiped out my red tomato crop when I was getting ready to harvest it. And one day I looked and they were pretty much all gone. I thought, wait a minute, I thought these were almost ready to harvest. Well, they were, but um, I think that was in the old But grubs have attacked other plants in the vegetable garden. And it's difficult to, to diagnose because they're underground. So you may see a plant that doesn't seem like it's doing well. And sometimes, as I did, you know, you say, okay, this looks like it's almost dead. I've tried a number of things. What's going on? Pull it out and dig a little bit, and there are grubs there. So the grubs are underground, and they eat the roots of, they love plants and shrubs, flowers, vegetables, but they can attack trees as well. It's going to take them longer because they can't eat, you know, giant roots, but they can, they can eat the little roots, and the little roots are important ones. We have a number of products. One of them is right here. We have this grub beater, and you can see the picture of how lovely these insects are. And I'm going to pretty soon apply this to a whole section of my yard. You sprinkle it and water it in um, because I know that there have been problems there. And in the wintertime, they, I think they go down a little bit deeper where the ground may be warmer. But they'll be back, and they'll be hungry, and there'll be a lot of them. They're definitely a problem around here. And, um, if you want to test to see if you think maybe you've got them, it's really simple. You can just just take a shovel full of dirt out in that affected area. And if you've got grubs, most likely you'll see them. And if you continue digging, you'll see more. So it's something that um, you know can be a problem, uh, but also, also can be treated. Um. With the grubs, there are two different products. There's one for your vegetable garden and one for other things. Um, I would not use this grub beater in your vegetable garden. Um, there is a garden dust uh, down in the lower house. Um, there's a couple of them that we bring in that are good for vegetable gardens that'll take care of that grub issue. Please put that on after your vegetable garden. Is 
His question was, is can you dig the, the one for the vegetables and yes, you can. Yeah, you can mix it up while you're digging. Absolutely. And that'll get rid of them because that's when you're going to notice them. <laughs> Oh, yeah, every, every spring you dig them up, you're going to find the mm -hmm. And you can always, I mean, picking them out is kind of nasty, but usually there's more than what you can pick out. So, yeah. Sometimes I, uh, when I'm digging up the vegetable garden and getting ready to plant, I'll, I'll stab them with my trowel. You know, just <laughs> <laughs> chop them in half, essentially, just you because, you know, bad. it's sort of like... <laughs> Revenge, you might say. I'm mad at them. I don't like them. They're in my yard. Too bad. But sprinkling some of the other kind, and Michelle, if you the other kind of pellets and dust for grubs um, that we have down there, that will work on other than vegetable areas also. Absolutely. Yeah. It, it's just a. It's in a smaller package, so um, if you have a large area that you need to treat. And, and it's not a vegetable garden, I would use that because it goes further. Um, otherwise, you can use either, you know, either one. If you want to use the dust in, on your trees, you can. Um, it's just not going to go as far. Yes, ma'am. Can you, when you're starting to plant, can you put that in as a preventative? In a vegetable garden, or should you just stay away entirely? So the question is about you're treating for grubs. You're treating for grubs. Can you? How's that? <laughs> treating for grubs. Can you put them into the vegetable garden when you're planting? And I think we were just talking about that. And the answer is yes. But for the vegetable garden, I would use the, the powder rather than this. But yes, you can treat it preventively because now the, the grubs are probably just kind of waking up. As we get warmer, they're going to come to life. They're going to be hungry. That's a good time to treat for them. And I had a problem not from with my flowers with the skunks trying to find the yeah. grubs. And so the skunks did as much damage digging up my flowers in the front. Uh, and then we found out this was So another, she was talking about skunks coming into the yard and looking for the grubs. That's another problem. It isn't just the grubs that can create havoc in your yard. The raccoons can do this as well, a number of animals. They, even javelinas, they smell the grubs underground. And I remember one morning when I, when I when not living here, I woke up and looked out in the backyard and the lawn looked like you know, sort of a carpet that had all been scrunched together because the raccoons had visited last night, the night before, and they said, oh, there's some grubs in here. We might as well just dig this up and eat the grubs. And it was pretty serious damage to the lawn. So that's why, you know, there's a secondary effect to these grubs. Not only they can eat the roots, but animals can come in and say, these are nice, juicy. Can't imagine eating a grub, but, you know, if you're a, a raccoon, maybe it tastes really good. Um, another product that we like to use as a preventative product um, is the plant protector. And I'm mentioning these now um, because timing is everything. Plant protector is a uh, product that you put on for bark beetle, uh, pine, uh, pinion scale, all those things that you're, you're going to start seeing here shortly. You want to get this in now. Um, you mix it up in a bucket, you put it around the trunk area, uh, the tree soaks it up, and it, it's a systemic drench. So um, now is a great time to do this. Uh, this is one of our feature products for this month um, because of the timing that you want to do. His question was, do you put it around the uh, spread of the tree or just around the trunk and it is just around the trunk. This is one of the few products that soak up through the, the, the cambium layer of the tree. Um, and this takes care of, like I said, the bark beetle, the scale, aphids uh, for like aspens, uh, ashes that tend to get aphids later in the, the year. Um, this is a one-time shot. It, it lasts all year so if you have trees, good time to protect it.
This is plant protector. There's some really cute ads that are going to be on that. Um, one of the things we wanted to talk about is how to identify issues. Um, most insects, you're, you're not going to see them on the top of the leaves, so sometimes close inspection is required. Um, you really want to look on the underside of the leaves. That, that's where they like to hide. It's cool. They're out of the way of predators, um, the ladybugs, the pyrium mantis. Um, so it's really, really important to check your garden often um, because uh, aphids can come in with the wind and the next day your rose is covered and if you don't check regularly, you're going to have issues and you're going to start having to spray. And sometimes what you have to look for and what you'll see is really the result of the bugs. You know, maybe sometimes it can even be too late. One example is thrips. Thrips also like roses, but they're really hard to see. And what the, you'll find is you've got these beautiful flowers and they don't open up and they look like they have these little holes in them. And so oftentimes what we'll do is we'll take that flower and just tap it against a piece of white paper. And you'll see these tiny little dots. Very hard to see without a you know, magnifying glass. Those are thrips. And uh, once you might as well just take that flower, cut it, and get rid of it, and try and treat for the thrips because they're going to stick around. Uh, it's not going to kill the plant, but it's really going to prevent the plant from flowering properly. So the, the key thing is you know, to try to understand what these things look like, and you know, understanding is the key to knowing how to address, uh, address a problem. Yeah. Okay, so we've been talking mostly about garden pests. Mm -hmm. The living kind, you might say, of insects. Another part of problems that can happen in your yard is uh, basically all kinds of fungus exists, fungi. And that's another thing where sometimes it may be um, a little bit late. I mean, you've seen the results of it, you know. Uh, and so typically, uh, when you have some kind of fungus in your yard, uh, you have to maintain the frame of mind that chances are you're not going to be able to get rid of this entirely. It's there, which is part of nature. But you can control it, you can minimize the losses. And the more that you understand about what's going on, um, the better um, you're going to be in terms of diagnosing what's in, happening in your garden and what you can do about it. Uh, powdery mildew is a common problem here. It would seem like, you know, it seems like kind of hard to figure out why do we have powdery mildew, we have a very dry climate, but as you know, in the winter time and also during the monsoon season, it gets kind of humid. Powdery mildew is a treatable condition. Most of these are rust and um, what are some of the other ones? The, uh, shot hole, shot black, hole. Uh, black spot. And a lot of times uh, the, the easiest solution is uh, uh, some kind of a fungicide. Copper fungicide works well with a lot of these. And maybe do it, you know, read the label, but a lot of times, you know, maybe several sprayings spread over a period of time would be good. The plants, the leaves that are affected are not going to be cured per se. They, what we're working to do, the goal is to minimize the damage and prevent it from happening for future growth. But you'll see that maybe, you know, like mycotinias have these little splotches on them some kind of fungal, or it may be got too cold for it. I don't really know what it is, but I'm going to probably treat them with a fungicide fairly soon because I see new growth is coming, so I don't want, if it is a fungus, I don't want that to spread to the new growth. Um, and there are plants that are kind of susceptible. We talked about roses. We know that roses can get a lot of things. They're beautiful plants, but they can have problems. Um, the red tip photinia like, goes right there. They're great privacy screens. Uh, you know, they can get fungus, they can get powdery mildew. Uh, I've got a bunch of these, you know, I cut them back, I, I look for problems, I try and treat them accordingly. So it's not something that's life-threatening to the plant, it's just part of the plant's life, the life in our yard, and the more that you understand, the better you are able to, to treat the plant. There are other plants that get powdery mildew that are notorious for it. Your, your cucumbers, your squash, um, every year I get it. Um, so I go into June 
um, before the monsoon season hits, knowing that it's coming. So I start spraying as soon as my squash plants get looking healthy um, or big enough to spray, not looking healthy. Um, but I, I, then I start spraying them because it, and if you're spraying ahead of time, those fungal issues won't, or the powdery mildew will not happen. Um, you'll stay on top of it and you'll keep it from happening. Um, same thing with the roses. Um, in June, I will start using the revitalized product that we have. It is another uh, systemic dredge that we have that you apply every three weeks. Um, you just pour it on with water into the ground as you're watering and it protects the plant from inside out. Um, copper fungicide is the other product that we have that you can just spray on the leaves. The one thing with fun uh, fungus is that once the leaves are infected, they're infected. They're not going to change. They're not going to go away. That leaf is going to continue with the spots or the, the powdery mildew. Pick those off if you can, um, unless you have to pick the whole plant. Obviously, you don't really want to do that. But if you can, get as many of the infected leaves off as possible um, and, and make sure that every time you get new growth, that's when you want to hit it again. Um, because it'll it will spread and the important thing also another important thing is that you avoid <clears throat> areas that are damp and, and shady and have poor circulation that can be a conducive environment to fungus and uh, it's important that at different times of the year especially in the fall the leaves drop you clean that up so you don't want anything overwintering in leaves so that litter from the plants, the leaves, you want to pick them up, pack them, get them out of there because you could have a fungus that's just overwintering and it's going to come back and, and bother you next spring. And do not mix um, leaves that are infected into your compost bin or you, you're just going to have issues and issues and issues. So just bag them up, trash them out. Um, if your leaves are good, go ahead. Um, just make sure that you're not putting infected leaves in your uh, About grasshoppers, um, none of these products help with preventing grasshoppers. However, um, in probably end of March, April, there is a product that's going to come in um, that uh, is called Nolobate, and I can't remember what the other one is called. Um, but uh, Nova Bait is a uh, pheromone in, in based uh, uh, granular that you put down that attracts them. Uh, so you put it on the outside of your property. The grasshoppers will eat it and, and it messes up with their digestive system. Um, so they can't eat anymore. Um, the other thing is if they pass it down to any eggs that they hatch after that like they're infected, so the babies are infected. So it's a great way to kind of uh, stop them in their tracks more or less. Um, once you have grasshoppers, the, the triple action works really well because it'll coat them, they can't fly, and it'll kill them. Uh, Multi-purpose insect spray also, um, if they, you already have them, will kill them. Um, about three hops and they're, they're done. Yeah, uh, last year was a really bad year for grasshoppers. And we didn't have Nova made available because of a problem, but we had another product that had the same ingredients. And the other thing that's good about a null vein or whatever product you use is that once a grasshopper dies because their digestion has been interfered, right, and they can't continue, uh, other grasshoppers will eat them. They're sort of cannibals, right, yeah. Michelle? Yeah. And, and so it'll yeah. pass on to other grasshoppers. Sometimes grasshoppers are large enough that you can actually pick them a hand if you choose to. Sometimes they, you know, they, they fly away. I had an experience once where I was riding my bike on the Peabine Trail. I think it was a day of migration day for the grasshoppers. And so I, I was trying to avoid them at first. And I thought, well, I could either, you know, do this and crash my bike, or I could just run over grasshoppers, which is probably a good thing for the plants around here. So I, I crunched over quite a few grasshoppers on that long bike ride. So you said, 
I actually spoke to the people who make Nolo Bay. I'm trying to get it. I, I've used it very successfully. Last year they had a fire. Yeah. And they're not going to have it ready for this season, but we carry something else. We do. We forget the name, but it's some several weird scientific name. But we carry a product that has the same active ingredient as Nolo Bay. Okay. Oh, it's, so, uh, it's not, you know, Nolo Bay is a brand name, obviously. Right. Well, all we care about is the ingredients of right. the product. And this, this product, which um, we, we had to do some searching around where we uh -huh. found it, uh, is, is the same thing as Nolo Bay. A lot of times people didn't believe that, you know, you're sort of. I want my refrigerator, I want my Phoenix, I want my Noble Bay, but as long as it, has, as it works for the problem, I think it's okay. So I'm sure we'll have, if Noble Bay's not ready, then I imagine this other company will have something. And it's, you know, it's kind of a, it's something that has a, kind of a short uh, shelf life. It's really kind of a fungus that you're feeding the grasshoppers, and it doesn't last all season, so you want them to eat it. That's why you want, you want to wait till they arrive, then you work on them and the, the plot. Question over there? So the question is, what plants are resistant to insects? And what, what, Michelle, would you uh, like to answer that? There, there are several plants that are resistant to insects, um, or, or kind of keep them away. Uh, marigolds are a great one. Um, Things that have tough leaves, like rhododendrons, um, insects don't usually chew them up. Um, but anything that has a smell to it, usually insects, I'm sorry? Like rosemary? Right, she said like rosemary. Rosemary, lavenders, uh, stuff like that, they usually stay away from. Um, so a lot of times in your vegetable garden, you'll do companion plantings. So you'll have your marigolds in there, you'll have your basil and your, your uh, rosemary um, kind of interspersed in your garden, and, and that usually will help keep down the, the insect issue. Also, all of those herbal plants that Michelle mentioned are less likely to be eaten by animals. I know that's a subject of another class, but there are multiple uses. The thing that has a strong herbal taste and smell is less likely to be eaten by deer, heavily rabbits, you name it, whatever pest you have in regard to animal pest. So there's multiple uses there. Um, so with that being said, and unless anybody else has any more questions, um, I will say this is a springtime is an exciting time or year for us right now. Uh, we have tons of exciting new trees, shrubs, plants, uh, ex exciting new people that are coming in. Uh, Larry's one of them. Uh, so he's just uh, lacking enthusiasm. Yeah. <laughs> trying to work on we'll that. Have to work on that. Um, so please take a, a trip around the nursery. We've kind of moved stuff around. Um, we've got a large tree section that's going to be up here where the fruit trees used to be. Um, springtime is a great time if you love uh, your uh, lilacs, your precipitas. Now's a great time to get those in. Um, some of them are just now starting to bloom on the other side of Doug. Um, so, uh, we're really excited, um, so if you guys have any other questions, please let us know. Um, when you get, before you sign off. Okay. Okay. Um, first of all, everybody remembers last Saturday. It was a little grim. Uh, we had nine hardy souls that showed up for our succulent class. So we've decided to repeat that class on this coming Friday at 3.30. So same thing, we're gonna be a little bit up here, then we'll get out of the store. If you wanna plant some succulents, we'll have the, the pots for $25 and, and the succulents and so on and so forth. The other thing I wanna mention is the weekend of the 17th of March is our 57th annual open house. In other words, Waters has been in business 57 years. We are having a special class on Friday and then Saturday and Sunday all day long. There will be uh, vendors here. Actually, as, as Ken always says, the guys that grow the plants, sometimes the guys that develop the name of the plant for you to talk to. 
and we'll have a special class that Saturday where we'll feature those people um, interacting with Ken. So there's some coming attractions, I guess, is the point that you want to kind of be aware of here. And uh, we appreciate the fact that you came today. And Thank you so much. One other thing that we may not have mentioned, if you're thinking about some shrubs or trees, we do have a, a planting crew that will deliver and they will plant them, get to make sure everything's off to a good start. And they're, uh, they're, they're, quite, they're quite skilled. So we just sometimes, I don't know about you, but in my yard, if I think about a place to plant, there's usually a rock there, and I, I decide not to plant it there. But they can help with that because they have jackhammers on the front. Thanks for coming, and come and see us if you have any other questions.